how we think about uh, the, the interface between humans and, and machines, uh, I think, is, is something that I know Joyce thought a lot about. This is where the idea of extended intelligence uh, you know, makes a lot of sense. Uh, it also is probably the better way of thinking about it for our economy and jobs, because people worry that, well, are we going to get into a situation where a machine's just doing everything? And one of the promising aspects of AI is it turns out that, for example, even in playing chess, uh, a computer with a human <laughs> oftentimes can do better. do better than just the computer. Well, think about that application you know, broadly to, to, to a lot of uh, disciplines. Um, what we want to be able to do is develop systems that are open enough, transparent enough that human judgment, human imagination, creativity are still intruding, uh, are, are still active, uh, but a lot of the routine stuff is happening day to day. And in some ways, that's just analogous to, you know, how we use calculators, right? It, you know, it's, a, it's an extension of our intelligence, um, it, but it's a simple enough one that it doesn't feel as threatening as it does, partly because we understand exactly what's going on. And with a lot of these systems, you start losing track of what are they doing? Uh, uh, and I know that's a problem you've been thinking about a lot. For us to be successful in these areas, um, we really have to think through the economic implications uh, because um, most people aren't spending a lot of time right now worrying about singularity. They are worrying about well, is my job going to be replaced uh, by a machine? And you know, uh, I tend to be on the optimistic side that historically we've absorbed new technologies uh, and people find that new jobs are created and they migrate and our standards of living generally go up. I do think that we may be in a slightly different period now simply because of the pervasive applicability of AI and other technologies, where uh, high skill folks do very well in, this, in these systems. They can leverage their talents, they can interface with machines to extend their reach, uh, their sales, their products, their services low-wage, low-skill individuals become more and more redundant and their jobs may not be replaced, but wages are suppressed. Uh, and if we are going to successfully manage this transition, we are going to have to have a societal conversation about um, you know, how do we manage that? How are we training and, and ensuring the economy is inclusive. You know, if in fact we're producing more than ever, but more and more of it's going to a, a small group at the top, how do we make sure that uh, folks have a living income? Uh, you know, what does it mean in terms of us supporting things like the arts or culture or uh, making sure our veterans are getting cared for. Uh, you know, the, so the, the, the social compact has to accommodate these new technologies, and our economic models have to accommodate them. The good news is we, that, that's not going to happen overnight. You know, let, let's say that's a 20, 30-year process. If we're making good decisions now, then we can build the runways so that by the time AI is fully incorporated into our economic life. Uh, people welcome it as opposed to reject it, but we can't assume that. And if uh, we continue on current trends, you're going to continue to see these populist movements, both on the left and the right, that believe that technology, globalization, AI, uh, the you know the guys who are off uh, on their own. Uh, you know, staring at a computer screen trying to figure this stuff out, that all of that is threatening to uh, uh, 
the, the day-to-day lives of ordinary people and, and the values that they cherish and, and, uh, and notions of community. And we have to, we have to guard against that. That starts with making sure the economy, economic implications are worked out. It's, it's, it's actually, though, non-intuitive which jobs get di- displaced. Because right. I would bet that um, if you had a computer that understood the medical system and was very good at diagnostics, the, 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 the resident nurse, the nurse or the pharm- pharmacist is the least, least likely to least be likely to be, And, and the maybe the, the, the amount of school they have to go to is just a community college instead yeah. of medical school. And my rule of thumb is if the person looks like they're doing work that a robot or an AI could do, they're going to be more likely to displace. And there's actually a very high level jobs, um, maybe some categories of lawyers or auditors that might disappear, whereas a lot of the service businesses, the arts, yeah. you know, I, I think that things that involve things that computers just aren't well suited for. And, and, and I think to you know, President Obama's point, I think that we have some time, and, and I don't know what you think about universal basic income, but, and I don't, I don't, I don't, but, but as we start to see people getting displaced, there's also this, this idea of work provides the structure for people, it provides the purpose. And so can we look at other models like academia or the arts where people have purpose or, 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 or people who are, um, take care of kids at home and can we somehow, because we don't calculate moms into GDP, right. it's crazy, right? So, so I think one of the problems is there's this general notion sort of on Wall Street, if, how can he be so smart and not have any money, right? And, 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 and now going into academia, I realize there are a lot of smart people with no money. And so, so, so I think that also this ties into the values of society yeah. because as we start to see other work, that may actually be viable work. Um, it just isn't, isn't viewed as work right well, now. Well, you're exactly right. And that's what I mean by redesigning the social compact. Now, whether a universal income is the right model, is that going to be accepted uh, by a broad base of people, you know, that, that, that's a debate that we'll be having over the next 10 years, next uh, 20 years. Um, and you're also right that the jobs that are going to be displaced by AI are not just low skill service jobs. They might be high skilled jobs, but ones that are repeatable and computers can do. Um, what is indisputable, though, is that um, as AI gets further incorporated and uh, the society potentially gets wealthier, that the link between production and distribution, how much you work and how much you make, gets further and further attenuated uh, because the computers are doing a lot of the work. And as a consequence, we then have to make some tougher decisions. We're, we already have this problem. It, it's just it's been, it, it's not as hypercharged as it's going to be. We underpay teachers despite the fact that that's a really hard job that's really hard for a computer to do well, to replace a really good teacher. But we don't value teachers because it used to be primarily women's work or because uh, you know, it, it, there are a whole host of reasons why we don't. For us to re-examine what we value, what we collectively are willing to pay for, whether it's teachers, nurses, uh, caregivers, uh, moms, dads who stay at home, <laughs> artists, uh, all the things that are incredibly valuable to us, but right now uh, don't rank high uh, on the totem pole. You know, that's a conversation that uh, we need to begin to have. And, and, and Joey's identified, I think, the, the, uh, the ways in which this could be solved. Um, But it's going to require, I think, a a new way of thinking, and, and that's not going to happen right away.